Chapter Thirteen of Jetta of the Lowlands by Ray Cummings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The flight to the bandit stronghold. During this flight of some six hours north, and then I think northeast to the remote lowland fastness where De Beers' base was located, I had no opportunity to learn much of the operation of this invisible flyer but it was the one which had been lost. Wrecked, no doubt, and the small crew aboard it all killed. The vessel, however, was not greatly damaged. The crew were killed, doubtless, by escaping poisonous gases when the flyer struck. How long it lay unfound, I cannot say. Perhaps for days. It still maintained its invisibility while the frantic planes of the U.S. Anti-War Department tried in vain to locate it, and then, with its magnetic batteries exhausting themselves, it must have become visible. Perona, making a solo flight upon Narita business to Great London, came upon it. Perona, Spawn, and De Beer were then in the midst of their smuggling activities. They salvaged the vessel secretly. De Beer, with an incongruous flair for mechanical science, was enabled in his bandit camp to recondition the flyer, building a workshop for the purpose with money which Perona freely supplied. Some of this I learned from De Beer, and some is surmise, but I am sure it is close to the facts. I have since had an opportunity, through my connections with this adventure, which I am recording, of going aboard one of the ex-flyers of the anti-war department and seeing it in operation, with its technical details explained to me. But since it is so important a government secret, I cannot set it down here. The principles involved are complex, the postulates employed, and the mathematical formula developing them in theory are far too intricate for my understanding. Yet the practical workings are simple indeed. Some of them were understood as far back as 1920 and 30, when that pioneer of modern astrophysics, Albert Einstein, first proved that a ray of light is deflected from its normal straight path when passing through a magnetic field. I am sorry that I cannot give here more than this vague hint of the workings of the fantastic invisible flyers which today are so often the subject of speculation by the general public which has never seen them, and perhaps never will. But I think, too, that a lengthy, pedantic discourse here would be out of place and tiring. After all, I am trying to tell only what happened to me in this adventure, and to little Jetta. A very strangely capable fellow, this young De Beer, a modern pirate, no other age could have produced him. He did not spare Perona's money, that was obvious. From his hidden camp, he must have made frequent visits to the great highland centers, purchasing scientific equipment, until now, when his path crossed mine. I found him surrounded by the most everyday devices of our modern world. The village of Narita was primitive, backward, save for its modern lights, a few local audiophones, and image finders, and its official etheric connections with other world capitals. It might have been a primitive Latin American village of a hundred years ago. But not so De Beers' camp, which presently I was to see, nor this his flyer, with which his smuggling activities had puzzled Hanley's office for so many months. There was nothing primitive here. De Beer himself was a swaggering villain. I saw him now with his cloak discarded, in the normal tube lights of the control room when, after a time, the mechanism of invisibility of the flyer was shut off. A fellow of six feet and a half at the very least, this De Beer. Heavy, yet with his great height and strength, lean and graceful. He wore a fabric shirt with a wide rolled collar a wide belt of tanned hide, with lighters, a little electronic drink cooler, 
and other knick-knackeries hanging from tasseled cords, and a naked, ugly-looking knife-blade clipped beside a holster, which held an old-fashioned exploding projector of leaden, steel-tipped bullets. His trousers were of leather, wide flaring, ending at his brawny bare knees, with wide-cut, limp leather boots flapping about his calves in ancient piratical fashion. They had flaring soles, these shoes, for walking upon the lowland caked ooze. The uppers were useless. I rather think he wore them because they were picturesque. He was a handsome fellow with rough-hewn features, a wide mouth, and very white, even teeth, a cruel mouth when it went grim. But the smile was intriguing. I should think particularly so to women. He had a way with him, this devil-may-care bandit, strange mixture of a pirate of old and an outlaw of our modern world, with a sash at his waist, a red handkerchief about his forehead, and a bloody knife between his teeth, I could have fancied him a fabled pirate of the Spanish main. A few hundred years ago, when these dry lowlands held the tossing seas. But I had seen him, so far, largely seated quietly in his chair at his instrument table, a cigarette dangling from his lips, and instead of a red bandana about his forehead, merely the elastic band holding the lens of his image finder. It caught in the locks of his curly black hair. He pushed it askew, and then, since he did not need it now, discarded it altogether. Where we went I could not surmise, except that we flew low over the sullen black waters of the Nary Sea, and then headed northeast. We kept well below the zero height, with the dark crags of the lowlands passing under us. The night grew darker. Storm clouds obscured the moon, and it was then that De Beer shut off the mechanism of invisibility. The control room, with only the watchful eye of Gutierrez now in it, besides De Beer, Jetta, and myself, was silent and orderly. But there were sounds of roistering from down the ship's corridor. The bandits, with this treasure of the radiumized quicksilver ingots aboard, were already triumphantly celebrating. I sat whispering with Jetta. De Beer, busy with charts and navigational instruments, ignored us, and Gutierrez, so long as we did not move, seemed not to object to our whispers. The night slowly passed. De Beer served us food, calling to one of his men to shove a slide before us. For himself, he merely drank his coffee and an alcoholic drink at his instrument table while absorbed in his charts. The roistering of the men grew louder. De Beer leaped to his feet, cursed them roundly, then went back to his calculations. He stood once before Jetta, regarding her with a strange, slow smile, which made my heart pound, but he turned away in a moment. The bandits, for all De Beer's admonitions, were now ill-conditioned for handling this flyer. But I saw, through the small grid opening in the control room ceiling, the pilot in his cubby upon the wingtop. He sat alert and efficient, with his lookout beside him. The night presently turned really tumultuous, with a great wind overhead, and storm clouds of ink shot through occasionally by lightning flashes. We flew lower, at minus two thousand feet on the average. The heavy air was sultry down here, with only a dim, blurred vista of the depths beneath us. I fancied now that we were bending eastward, out over the great basin pit of the mid-Atlantic area. No vessels passed us, or if they did, I did not sight them. De Beer had a detector on his table. Occasionally it would buzz with calls, liners, or patrols, in our general neighborhood. He ignored them with a sardonic smile. Once or twice, when our dim lights might have been sighted, he altered our course sharply. And when, at one period, we passed over the lights of some lowland settlement, 
he flung us again into invisibility until we were beyond range. I had, during these hours, ample opportunity to whisper with Jetta, but there was little for us to say. I knew all of Spawn's and Perona's plot. Both were dead. It was De Beer with whom we were menaced now. And as I saw his huge figure lounging at his table and his frowning, intent face, the vision of the aged, futile Perona, who had previously been my adversary, seemed inoffensive indeed. De Beer was obviously pleased with himself. He had stolen half a million dollars of treasure and was making off with it to his base in the depths. He would smuggle these ingots into the world markets at his convenience. Months from now, probably. Meanwhile, what did he intend to do with me? And Jetta? Ransom me? I wonder how he could manage it. And the thought pounded me. What about Jetta? I felt now that she was all the world to me. Her safety, beyond any thought of smugglers or treasure, was all that concerned me. But what was I going to do about it? I pressed her hand. Jetta, you're not too frightened, are you? No, Philip. Her mind, I think, was constantly on her father, lying dead back there on his garden path. I had not spoken of him save once. She threatened instant tears, and I stopped. Do not be too frightened. We'll get out of this. Yes. He can't escape. Jetta, he can't hide. Why, in a day or so, all the patrols of the United States Lowland Service will be after us. But if the patrol ships assailed De Beer, if he found things going badly, he could so easily kill Jetta and me. He might be caught, but we would never come through it alive. My thoughts drifted along, arriving nowhere, just circling in the same futile rounds. I was aware of Jetta falling asleep beside me, her face against my shoulder, her fingers clutching mine. She looked like a half-grown, slender, ragged boy. But her woman's hair lay thick on my arm, and one of the dark tresses fell to my hand. I turned my fingers in it. This strange little woman. Was my love for her foredoomed to end in tragedy? I swore then that I would not let it be so. End of chapter 13